welcome to Real Ag Live, everybody. It is Thursday. Thanks a lot for joining us. Really appreciate you making Real Ag Live a part of your day. And of course, at uh, 4.30 Eastern, 2.30 Mountain, Real Ag Radio will be on Rural Radio 147 as well. Today's guest on Real Ag Live, he is with the Conservative Party of Canada. He is the MP for Foothills. He is the Shadow Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. We are joined today by John Barlow. Hey, John, how's it going? Sean, thanks very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Doing well. Yeah, awesome stuff. Uh, you Are you back in uh, High River today or are you in Ottawa? Uh, no, back in the riding today. Uh, spent a couple of weeks in Ottawa, but I uh, got back on Friday and, and happy to be home. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Okay, John, we're going to try to cover as much ground as we possibly can here today. If anybody has a question for John, make sure you type it in the comment box below. we got a few already uh, hopping in there. We'll get to them right away. Uh, but if you do have a question, put it in the comment box, whether you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. We always try to have as much uh, interaction with the audience as we can here on our Real Ag Live broadcast. Okay, John, uh, let's get to it. Uh, I, I guess it, let, let's start with what this, la this past two months has been like for agriculture. There has been no shortage of issues related to livestock, fruit and veg, it is really, really being a challenge for a lot of growers across this country. Yeah, it has. It's, this has probably been uh, one of the more trying times uh, that I can remember. But, um, you know, we can't blame all of this on, on COVID. A lot of this started, um, you know, well before the pandemic and has just um, been accentuated as a result of this pandemic, you know, bad harvest. Uh, then a, a rail strike and then legal blockades, uh, you know, increase in the carbon tax and all, all of these things have just uh, been a, a body blow after body blow to uh, the agriculture sector. And, and now things have really come to a head as, uh, you know, the, the financial crunch has, has hit. Yeah, for sure. Do you, like, do you think that though, like there, there's a lot of talk about the carbon tax at, right now from some of mainly from the Western farm groups. We also hear the GFO in Ontario talking about it as mm -hmm. well. Do, like where do, is that is that very high right now on the pecking order of issues to be dealt with or is it something that we can't let leave the the discussion it still needs to be part of the narrative no i, I think it is uh, when you talk to producers um it is still a top uh, two or three issue uh, i was on a, a zoom call with uh, with producers from across alberta last night and, and the carbon tax was still front of mind for them uh, i think if you know there are so many things out of their control. There are so many variables that uh, producers have to deal with. Uh, but in the middle of a pandemic, um, to increase a tax uh, is is really tough to swallow for them. And uh, you know whether it's grain drying or you know using propane and natural gas on on farm or heating barns, all of these types of things have have costs to them, and they're price takers. They cannot pass these costs on to someone else. So. They are the ones who are carrying the bulk of the burden of this tax increase. And when you look at everything else that they're having to deal with right now, it just um, it just doesn't make sense uh, for a federal government to increase a tax on them right now. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I know that uh, there is a lot of growers across this country that very, very much agree with that. In fact, you know, even in my own business here, you know, travel is a major, major right. cost. And it's it's not easy to, to pass those costs uh, along as some may think. Okay, question here. Uh, Lindsay, who uh, is uh, one of our field editors at realagriculture.com, but also farms just outside of Ottawa, she asks, what is the Conservative Party of Canada's solution to BRM program improvement, egg stability sp specifically? Well, I think first off that um, I know a lot of the stakeholder groups are, are looking at changes to egg stability to deal with this pandemic. But I think all of us would agree that these business risk management programs were never designed to deal with a pandemic of this nature. Even if they were to make some changes before the enrollment deadline on July 3rd, um, you may not see that payout for months and sometimes years down the road. At that point, it's too late. Um, when we've seen, uh, you know, as many as 30,000 farms uh, at risk of bankruptcy. But I want to take a look, and we've talked about this, you know, before COVID. I think the business risk management programs have um, have become obsolete. Uh, they're not bankable. They're not timely. Uh, they're not efficient. Uh, I think there's other ways that we can do this, and I think we really have to start from from scratch. Um, I think farmers should be getting credit for their conservation and stewardship uh, and their carbon sequestration rather than being punished with a carbon tax. Is there some way we can monetize that like they have in the United States? 
Uh, so I think there are some opportunities for us to take a really good hard look at what these business risk management programs are, what we actually want them to accomplish, and how they will actually work for agriculture. Now, the last time there was BRM reform, it was under the Harper government, was it? Like, what was missed at that time by the, the former conservative governments on trying to set up BRM so it worked for, for most farmers across the country? Well, I think when we made the changes to the BRM programs uh, under Jerry Ritz, um, you know, we have to take a look. The landscape for agriculture is very different now than it was uh, eight, seven or eight years ago. Uh, when we made the changes to the reference margins on agri-stability, for example, a lot of producers were profiting off that. And there wasn't a lot of, um, let's say, demands to to improve, you know, to ch- make massive changes to the BRM programs because agriculture was doing well at that time. Um, but now you look over the last uh, four or five years, you have a carbon tax. We've lost $5 billion in foreign markets, uh, you know, illegal blockades. Uh, you know, all, all of these things have had a significant impact on, on where agriculture is now. So I think that's the, ma- the major change. It's not that we missed something. It's the fact that the landscape and the reality around agriculture has changed significantly. Okay. Uh- Question here from Danny Ottenbright. He for, he farms out in Grace in Saskatchewan. I know him because he's one of the <laughs> he's a frequent uh, get or a listener of Real Ag Radio and and uh, he uh, goes to realagriculture.com all the time. He, so he's looking at this from a strictly a cash cropping perspective. But his comment is, why not scrap agri stability and agri recovery, and and why not just have better crop insurance? I I couldn't agree with him more. I think that is definitely something we have to look at and. Uh, Mr. Oddbright, a, a royal family name in that in that neck of the woods. I uh, grew up in York and Saskatchewan, so I know the Oddbrights well. Um, uh, and Barn 22 and Grayson. I don't know if uh, that's. I don't think that's still going anymore. But uh, I, I think I saw Nazareth there once. But uh, <laughs> oh, classic, classic. Yeah, hair bands. Was yeah, cool. sorry, but it was it was great. Um, but uh, to to his question, I think he's exactly right. I think we have to have. Uh, something like I said that that's much more manageable, much more efficient. Something that's actually bankable. Um, and sometimes we we make things way too comp- more complicated than they need to be. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's a great suggestion. So isn't the challenge here the the one of like the fact that it's so diverse? And I and I think that I've heard this comment coming up a lot from you know people that are really really following farm policy that the current government has had a hard time understanding of some of the reforms that need to happen because agriculture is not agriculture is not agriculture. You know, the needs of the fruit and veg industry, what they go through is different than say a cow calf producer in Saskatchewan versus somebody's running a, you know, um, some operation in, in Abbotsford, BC. And I, I think the diversity it's, it's, it's great for our industry, but in this case, it's really hard to make something simple. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, that is fair. And I think even uh, what I've learned over the last few years is, uh, you know, again, let's talk about agri stability. A lot of those industries don't, uh, it doesn't work for them. You know, cow calf operators don't use agri stability. A lot of the fruit and veg guys uh, in Ontario don't don't use it. Um, you know, an enrollment is around 35% or, or lower um, because there is so much variety out there and, and everybody's business model is a little bit different. Uh, so to, to say there's a one-size-fits-all program, I think we've learned over the last few years that's just not the case. Um, you know, yeah. the, the cow-calf guys would much prefer to see an enhanced uh, livestock insurance price protection program than, than help with egg stability. Well, even in the U.S., you know, where there has been a lot of uh, direct ad hoc payments here in the last three years, and, and their COVID their, their COVID response has been the CFAP program that they just started taking applications for here in the last couple of weeks – that that's all been in a response because the farm bill wasn't designed to deal with a pandemic. So I think there's a lot of countries we're being, you know, we're critical of the Canadian system, but there's a lot of countries that are going through the same process of we weren't set up for this and we need to figure out how we are going to provide a safety net, some, some risk management tools for farmers so that we don't have to be doing ad hoc sort of things. Like I, I think that that's just what we're seeing some of the Ontario growers, the GFO has taken a very aggressive stance, a uh, very aggressive campaign against this current federal government on what they are doing or not doing 
for agriculture. What do you think about some of the requests that are being made from some groups like the GFO for some form of direct payment, a, a sort of a, a direct cash subsidy, so to speak? Right. You know, to go back to your to your first point, Sean, I think you're exactly right. And I, I think all of us um, as elected officials are frustrated with the fact that we are doing these things almost by the seat of our pants, um, that there was no strategy in place. Like, I think for us to say that we would never see a pandemic is, is pretty naive. I think most experts said this was eventually going to happen. Uh, and we've been through BSC. Uh, we should have had uh, a strategy and a template in place. Uh, we knew African swine fever was a real threat. Why, why isn't there a strategy already in place for that? So to that point, I, I think that is a real um, miss for, for governments at all levels, that there wasn't a pandemic strategy for every industry, not just agriculture. Um, but I, I think to uh, the OFA's position is, you know, a, I think it's good that uh, stakeholder groups are starting to get vocal about some of the, the obstacles that they are facing. All too often as, as uh, parliamentarians, we have these groups come and talk to us in our offices and, and say, you know, we need A, B, and C. And then we go out in the House of Commons and start asking for A, B, and C. <laughs> but they go to the Liberals and say, oh, no, no, everything's fine. And it's, you know, you can kind of pull your hair out sometimes. So at some point, you have to say enough is enough. You know, we can't go any longer under the current um, structure. We need, we need assistance. Uh, I don't think any farmer uh, wants ad hoc um, supports, but in times like this, in times of a crisis, when um, you, you know you're giving nine billion dollars to students, um, and then you give you know 250 million to an entire industry, that that's that stings. Uh, where where is your priorities? And at a time like this, I think there has to be uh, some of financial assistance, and you can't just keep adding on more debt or asking them to to blow through their savings first before uh, any assistance is offered. So that bar you're talking about in Grayson, Danny says it's still standing, but it's not holding events. That is that is too bad. I could go through the bands that I've seen there over the years and I good good, good memories. Good memories. Okay, here's a here's a question from Daryl Franzu. Uh, he is current I believe he's current chairman of the Western Wheat Growers. Uh, yeah, it says congratulations. John, yeah. Uh, John, farm organizations, Western Wheat Growers included have continued to offer evidence that policies like the carbon tax punish primary producers. We have offered solutions to BRMs. We have asked for a plan on how some markets, we how, how we've lost some markets and how we can get them back. Uh, all has seemingly fallen on deaf ears. How can farmers and farm lobby get our message across and augment some of the efforts you and your colleagues have put in? That's a great question, uh, Daryl. And I think uh, you're exactly right. And I think the first part of that is I don't think the current government understands um, the impact the carbon tax has on agriculture. I, I don't think they have seen the true numbers, and uh, I don't know if, if anybody can really nail that down. Um, I've certainly seen bills in the tens of thousands of dollars, but that doesn't include um, the cost being passed on producers from the guy hauling their grain or the guy hauling their cattle uh, or the fertilizer companies. All of those things are being passed on. So uh, I think the, the cost of the carbon tax on producers is is in the tens of thousands. And I would say, and for larger operations, maybe in the hundreds of thousands. So the government A needs to understand those numbers and we have to collect that data and show it to them. Uh, unfortunately, when I did the order paper question earlier this year and asked for the data on the carbon tax, so the answer I got from Ag Canada was that information is secret. Uh, I find that really tough to swallow uh, when you are putting a tax that is directly impacting a critical industry, which every province has said is an essential uh, service. How can you not share that information or be transparent about the impact of the carbon tax. The second part of that to Daryl's question, I think, is just a matter of agriculture and rural economies are just not a priority for this Liberal government. This is not where their support is. Um, even I had a CBC radio uh, reporter ask me, "Is it are they not helping agriculture because all of the Liberal voters are urban? Um, you know, if CBC is making that connection, I think there's there's something to that, that uh, they don't see it as a big priority. Yeah, there is a question down here further uh, that related to that. So Viren asks, I've heard from some elected officials that they have a hard time figuring out what agriculture wants when there are multiple producer groups with an ask. What would government like to see? Um, yeah, that's a good question. But I think during this COVID issue, I think most of the 
I think the asks have been fairly unanimous. I think the agriculture sector have been um, maybe in an unprecedented for our history have been really united in their asks on how to deal with the COVID crisis. So I would say at this time they have been really united and they have been speaking with with one voice. Certainly each industry has their nuanced asks, but for the most part it's it's some sort of business risk management program uh, to be eligible for the emergency business account. Uh, to ensure that they have the the labor that that is needed, uh, I think those main three have been um, been pretty pretty consistent. Okay, question here from uh, Sherilyn Nagel, Farms in Saskatchewan. Anything we should be prepared for in anticipation of the ratifying of USMCA on July first? Sorry, Sean, I lost you there for a sec. Oh, okay. Can you just say that again? Yeah, so question from Sherilyn Nagel. Anything we should be prepared for in anticipation of the ratifying of USMCA on July 1st? Uh, you shouldn't see any major um, changes. Uh, I think the one sector of agriculture that, that will be impacted the most is obviously uh, supply management, dairy. Um, I think Canadians need to understand that for the first time in our history, we have relinquished sovereignty over our over our foreign trade to another country. Um, the United States now has, con- let's say, substantial input on the growth of certain milk products, uh, the growth of uh, that industry outside of you know our. For Canada to sign agreements with other markets that we don't have agreements with now, non-market entities like China, like Vietnam. Uh, for us to sign a free trade agreement with those countries, we would first need to get uh, the okay from the United States, which is incredible. No other trade agreement we ever sign has that sort of um, sign-off from a country that's not even in that that agreement. So I know right now it's focused only on dairy, but my concern would be now we've op- cracked open the door, what's next? Is it going to be cattle, as we heard Donald Trump a couple of weeks ago make a comment on on live cattle? Is it going to be grain? Is it going to be canola? You know, we don't know. Uh, but I don't think you'll see any major changes with with UMCA um, ratified on July 1st. Yeah, on that on that clause or that text that involves the the non-market economies, uh, actually, there was news out last week where Mexico is going to call the U.S. out on that clause, and they want details of the U.S.-China trade deal. So mm. it, that that's going to be an interesting uh, piece of drama, and we'll see. Uh, when Because every, everybody assumed it was the U.S., going to direct Canada and Mexico on what they could or could not do with China. It will be interesting to see uh, when the shoe's on the other foot how that works out or what information is shared, so to speak. Well, it was good It was good timing by the United States to get their deal done with China first and then put that clause in the USMCA <laughs> saying, well, no, we've got our great deal, whether it's great or not, but uh, Mexico and Canada, you want to get a deal, you got to come through us first. <laughs> like it. Uh, yeah. Question here from Kevin Surface. Uh, who farms in Southern Alberta, the border closure because of the pandemic was not supposed to hinder trade. We are finding unless actual products can be put on a commercial truck, trade is being disrupted because not everything moves that way. If the border remains closed past June 21st, will the Conservative Party of Canada push to loosen some of the restrictions? Yeah, a great question, uh, Kevin. I know we've uh, talked about this. Uh, Kevin is just outside of my riding in, in Southern Alberta. Um, and he's right. Um, there have been issues at the border, um, and that should not be the case uh, with agriculture. Any movement of agriculture products is supposed to be able to move across um, the border. But I know uh, Kevin specifically and some other producers have been questioning or been forced to quarantine when they come back into Canada, and that shouldn't be the case uh, for agriculture. So I, I have spoken to my counterpart uh, in Montana. Um, they are equally as eager to see um, the border restrictions lifted. And uh, we will definitely be pushing uh, for that. But to that question, specifically, essential trade should be moving across that border unimpeded. Uh, But there have been some issues with individual um, Canadian Border Service guards and the United States um, at the border. And unfortunately, there hasn't there's been a real lack of consistency. And I have spoken with Health Canada and public safety, and we are trying to address that. Yeah, I've heard a lot of mixed things from producers across the country. Some people have said they've had no trouble crossing to, say, pick up tires or parts that they had bought in the United States. And some people saying, like, it's like a no-go, like there's no way you can cross. 
Uh, most people that are flying down on business haven't had as many of the hassles and the issues. It's been more crossing by ground is based on what I've heard. One, and John, this may be way outside your wheelhouse, but I'm going to ask it because we're on this topic. So just defer if you, if you, if you have to. It, it, on the border reopening, could they, does, is it like an all or none scenario? Like, could they open, like, the Alberta-Montana border but keep other parts closed? Or is it, like, the Canadian-U.S. border is the Canadian-U.S. border? That's a, that's a great point, and I, I don't know that. And um, I would suspect, you know, in Montana, for example, I think they have three cases uh, of COVID in the entire state. So that uh, might be very different in Michigan and Minnesota, New York. Um, so that would make a lot of sense to do, um, you know, phase, opening by phases, uh, but I don't know if that's something that's been discussed. That's a great point. Something we should look into. Yeah. Uh, question here from Brian Kennedy, who's with Alberta Wheat. He says, what changes would the Conservative Party of Canada like to see regarding the Canadian Grains Act? Oh, that's a great, great question. Uh, that definitely it's, uh, it was in our platform in, in 2019 going into the election uh, to to address that. We know uh, we've had lots of conversations with uh, with stakeholders on that issue specifically. Um, you know, the, I think there's you know the 160 million dollars sitting in in a bank account. Uh, is there some way we can waive fees until that has been um, addressed? I, I know some have asked for it to be paid back, but I don't think that's that's realistic. Um, but we do want to see that that updated. But not just that too is is harmonization of regulations certainly between Canada and the United States. Um, we are seeing a lot of our industry, you know, uh, seed research, uh, pesticide research, herbicide, go south of the border because it's taking so long to get those things done here. Uh, so I think that's a, that was an opportunity missed in USMCA is to, to harmonize some of those regulations as well. Okay. Um, the, 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 the whole process of updating the Grains Act has kind of been pushed back. We posted a story at realairculture.com. Oh, is it? Earlier this week, I think it was. <laughs> the week flies by. Uh, yeah, you don't even know what day of the week it is. Yeah, anymore. I know. Ba I know it's Thursday. Uh, ba <laughs> basically, because of COVID, pushing this all back. Uh, are you going to be pressing the government to to move ahead as fast as they can with this uh, this revision of the Grains Act? Yeah, there's no question that, that COVID has thrown a, a lot of uh, things into flux, and and some things have just been pushed to the back burner and. And as conservatives, we ourselves have not been uh, pressing on some of these things right now. We understand the situation, but uh, things like uh, the Grains Act, um, the negligible risk application for BSC, uh, we want that to make sure that that gets in after they missed last year. So we have started picking up on some of these um, other issues again now that uh, now that we're sort of starting to come out of COVID and and uh, some of these issues are still really important and they I. I I think the government can walk and chew gum at the same time, and they should be able to do some of these things um, while still dealing with COVID. Question here from Devin Walker, who's watching on Facebook. Hearing murmurs of India and the pulse tariffs relaxing, how can Canada help to keep opening up their markets and keeping trade beneficial? Yeah, that's great news that uh, India has relaxed uh, some of the tariffs on, on, on peas and pulses. Uh, and I think we have to understand the important role that global affairs plays. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, uh, Sean, that we have lost about $5.6 billion in foreign market access. And the most frustrating thing for this with, for producers is this has nothing to do with quality or uh, issues with the product. This was you know, political blunders, um, political mistakes, and we can't have that. Um, we have to understand that our position uh, around the world as a trusted trading partner is critically important. Um, and we, we can't have those types of mistakes. We can't do diplomacy by Twitter. We can't, uh, uh, you know, have a, a foolish tour of, of India that, that blows up in our face. Um, we have to uh, take these relationships seriously um, and treat them as a, as a business relationship. And I think that's what, we, what we've been missing. Well, Devin's question was about India, and of course, the the Prime Minister's trip to India is well, you know, that that kind of fit into at least the puzzle or the narrative of some of the challenges that we've had w with India. But what about China? Uh, hmm. Do you, do you, from an agricultural perspective, what do you want to see happen here? We we have. I would say the Conservative Party, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Conservative Party is much more hawkish on China than the current Liberal Party. But being hawkish may be counter to increasing exports to the country. So wh where do you find the balance here? 
Yeah, it's true. Uh, we have been more hawkish on our relationship with China. We've asked for the ban on, on Huawei and, and our Canada's 5G network. We, we want to pull out of the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Uh, but a lot of this is in response to what China has done uh, to Canada. And I, I, you know, this is my opinion, and, but uh, China responds well to a show of strength. Uh, you know, they, they imprisoned unlawfully two Canadian citizens. Um, they have, uh, you know, bl- banned or blocked Canadian canola seed ex- imports as well as soybeans. We've seen big hits in both of those two industries. Uh, with the decision on uh, Ng Wang Zhu last week uh, to not allow her extradition, I-, I think that we have to brace ourselves for further action from China, much as they did to the barley tariffs to Australia. Um, yeah. But you have to sh- you have to counter strength with strength, and I think that's uh, that's what we have to do. And I, I want to caution, or, or I don't want to belittle the fact that this may hurt our agriculture sector, and we are aware of that. But at some point in time, you have to stand up to a bully. Could it be the same sort of ask that we've seen in the U.S. from the Republicans? You know, we we hear President Trump talk a lot about you know American farmers, the great patriots, and you know they're kind of taking it on the chin with some of the the things that need to be done in the greater picture, and it, it has hurt some of their exports, could we say see the same kind of uh, request? That's kind of what I'm hearing from you. Yeah, I, th- I think it's certainly possible. And we, we, we don't want to lose the, you know, markets the size of China, for, for sure. Uh, and we will have to, to look at other markets, perhaps. Um, but I think coming out of COVID, uh, there is going to be a much larger emphasis from countries around the world to really take a look at their global relationships, whether that's politically, uh, economically, through trade, uh, and you are going to be much more cognizant of building those relationships with your must, your most trusted trading partners. Um, and I think as Canadians, we're going to have to take a look at being much more self-sufficient, not relying so much on a, a couple of markets for, uh, for you know, whether it's PPE or, or manufacturing, those types of things. Start to attract some of that stuff back to Canada uh, to build our processing capacity here, manufacturing here, uh, but also re- ensuring our trading partners are um, – not the bad actors. And, and Lindsay reminded me that the India tariff reduction is in is in lentils only at this point. Right. The good news for for Canadian lentil producers is that the the reduction does not include American lentils. So Canada will have right. a market access advantage into India over our our U.S. Uh, northern pulse grower c- competitors. Uh, there is another question here. I'll go back here. Hold on a second. Uh, where is it here? There's a question from Danny about, oh, here it is. Uh, what, this is from Danny on right. Uh, would a carbon sequestration payment program be a problem at the WTO level? Well, so far it hasn't been with the United States has teamed with Cargill to do a, a part pilot project to do something similar along that line. Um, you know, there are ways to get around those subsidy le- levels, I guess. Um, the United States gets away with it all the time. Um, but, I, you know, it's something we would have to look at. But I think it's something we have to, to look to to investigate. And I think it, it, it offers two, um, two solutions or two reasons why we have to do this. Number one, it's another revenue stream for agriculture without having to rely on those business risk management programs. Number two... Um, it will help us hopefully change the narrative about modern Canadian agriculture and the role it plays in Canada's economy. We were talking earlier about that disconnect between urban and rural. And it's not that urban Canadians don't care, it's just that they don't know. And if we were able to tell the story about the, the role that Canadian agriculture plays in, in carbon sequestration, conservation of water, soil, land, uh, you know, environmental stewardship, maybe can urban Canadians will start to understand a little bit better about what modern Canadian agriculture actually is, where our food comes from, who grows it, how we do it, and why we do it. So I think there's two really critical benefits to, to having that, that type of a program. Uh, I wanna, we want to jump back uh, regarding, uh, Sherilyn asked a question about the USMCA earlier. I want to ask a follow-up to that. Uh, you had mentioned one of the industries that really this impacts the most is the supply managed sector. We know that dairy farmers uh, are going to be getting compensation for the CETA and the CPTPP agreement where they give up market access. Is the Conservative Party pushing for uh, compensation for the trade access given up in the USMCA agreement to the U.S.? 
Well, I think there's an opportunity here to to do it without having to give um, you know billions of dollars. And one of those areas is the TRQ or the, the the trade licenses. We want those to be as close to the farm gate as possible. So right now it's you know there's a percentage that goes to the retailers and a percentage that goes to the processors. Uh, the, the United States has now asked that 100% of those TRQs go to the retailers, which would help a great deal large American companies, the Walmarts uh, of the world. We want those to go as close to the farm gate as possible, and that would be a way to offer compensation to the producers and processors just by giving them um, more control over the sale of those imported products. And that they, they support that. Uh, so that's one aspect that I think uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, whether or not the Liberals follow with that recommendation or not. Um, but I haven't seen the Liberals' compensation package that's been offered uh, as a part of the USMCA, and I know uh, they still haven't uh, released uh, CETA and TPP yet either. So mm. it's that's in the Liberals' uh, court, and until we see what they're offering, um, then we'll wait, then we'll criticize, you know, offer our suggestions. Yeah, I, I know that, you know, in your role, John, it is to be the critic, it's the shadow minister, it's to make sure you're holding the the, the party in power basically holding them accountable. Um, what would you say is on the agricultural file, something that the, the current liberal government is doing really, really well right now? <laughs> I don't get asked that very often, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a tough, that's a tough question. Uh, because I, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be overly, overly partisan here, but I think uh, I would be disingenuous if I said that they have really stepped up, um, for agriculture over the last four or five years, and especially during during this crisis, um, you know, even the little things, you know, closing a, a CFIA office in, in Prince Albert, we heard this week, uh, they have shut down all um, field research for the rest of the year. You know, all of these little things, and I think it goes right to the very root. Is um, you know, the, the agriculture ministers, as much as I, I think they try, and I, I think they have the, the best of intentions. They just don't have the clout at the cabinet table, and I think that's really where the the, the problems begin. And unless they can convince their cabinet colleagues, starting with Finance Minister Bill Morneau and the Prime Minister, to take agriculture seriously, it's very very difficult to uh, uh, to make some make some headway. Is that our challenge? Like I know that you know obviously in agriculture we focus on Minister Babo, but mm -hmm. is agriculture's challenge right now at the Finance Minister's office? I, I believe it is. I believe it's, uh, you know, you take a look at some of the, the, the programs that have, have come out over the last few years, whether it's the changes to the food guide, uh, front of pack labeling, the new transportation rules, a lot of the, the carbon tax, a lot of these things have been based on, on activist ideology, ideological positions, not based on, on science and data. In fact, they, they fly in the face of the, the data that we have and, and the science experts who have, who have talked to us about these things. So I think absolutely our, our, our biggest obstacle is right at the cabinet table where um, they are making decisions based on, on activism and ideology, ideology rather than what's best for Canada. Hmm. Uh, hey, John, I really, really do appreciate you giving us time here today. I, the audience had some fantastic questions. I didn't even get to some of mine because <laughs> the, the audience just kept, uh, go, kept, kept on going here. So, Hey, I, I, I really do appreciate everybody tuning in, John. I appreciate your time very much. Uh, Sean, it's always a pleasure. Happy to be back anytime. Uh, we're going to be back with Real Ag Live next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern or 1 o'clock Mountain, depending on where you are in the country. Thank you very much, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Live. Don't forget to tune in to Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147 at 430 Eastern, 230 Mountain. Cheers, everybody.